Hi, I'm Talia Baroncelli, and you're watching the Analysis.news. I'll shortly be joined by political economist and friend of the show, Patrick Bond, to speak about the final document produced at COP28, as well as a divided position of BRICS countries vis-a-vis -vis Israel and its ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. If you'd like to support the work that we do, you can do so by going to our website, theanalysis.news, and hitting the donate button at the top right corner of the screen. Get onto our mailing list and like and subscribe to the show wherever you watch the show. Help us beat the algorithm on YouTube by liking and subscribing there as well. See you in a bit with Patrick Bond. Joining me now is Patrick Bond. He is a political economist and professor of sociology at the University of Johannesburg, where he directs the Center for Social Change. He is also the author of the book Bricks, an Anti-Capitalist Critique, which he co-authored with Anna Garcia. It's a pleasure to have you back on, Patrick. Thanks. Great to be with you as ever, Tanya. So the UN Climate Conference COP28 took place over a period of two weeks, and it was presided over by UAE Sultan Al Jaber, who is coincidentally also the Adnoc oil executive, and co-managed by South Africa's environment minister, Barbara Creasy. And the final document they produced at COP is known as a global stock take. So it's meant to assess whether the um, commitments in the Paris Agreement are actually being implemented. And one of the most significant lines of this stock take is the following commitment, and I quote, transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy systems in a just, orderly, and equitable manner, accelerating action in this critical decade so as to achieve net zero by 2050 in keeping with the science. So what do you make of this sort of weaselly statement? Yes, it's very good to be able to pick apart and dissect the power relations, the institutions, and even individuals who've been putting pressure so that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, Conference of the Parties 28, sometimes we just keep it short, the Conference of Polluters 28, that this institution has again failed the planet. I mean, it's uh, usually in two ways. One is to fail to cut emissions and fossil fuels specifically, and the other is to deny liability for the pollution, the so-called polluter pays, in which the emissions that have been uh, uh, causing climate catastrophe, mostly historically, number one, United States, number two, China, um, and uh, Russia, India, uh, Brazil, uh, the, some of the, the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, are also in that uh, top 10, UK, Germany. Uh, and what they really want to do, and especially uh, this time, the OPEC, oil producing exporting countries, the big uh, oil cartel, led by Saudi Arabia. They wanted to avoid a formal commitment to phase out both oil and gas. They're willing to phase down coal. So that language is there. Um, but even methane gas, which later on in the document is acknowledged to be one of the most crucial areas, especially for methane leakage, to cut right away, you can see that wording transitional is as you say, it's a weasel word because what they're then saying is that a transitional fuel to get you out of oil uh, and coal is gas. So the contradictions and internal conflicts that we can see within uh, the climate policy elite are screaming out, but uh, no more so now uh, than at a conference hosted by uh, the UAE, which itself under uh, Sultan al Jaber and his uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company played a very, very uh, pernicious role in the COP and has actually openly acknowledged that they want to continue uh, their own um, uh, expansion of their oil and gas. And they're going to probably do a 50% expansion uh, in this next seven or eight years before 2030. And then they're meant to peak and then finally go to net zero by 2050. So it's all a, a fair bit of mumbo jumbo, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it is the first document pr um, produced by a COP, which actually does identify fossil fuels as a culprit. So do you think that's just a sort of declaratory acknowledgement and it doesn't really have any teeth? Yes, that's the dilemma because the weasel words include, um, especially for coal, the term abated. And if you uh, want to abate 
uh, your call, uh, you know, then then you basically go through one of the loopholes and you can continue. The unabated means you haven't put in uh, these gimmicks like carbon capture and storage. And that, um, as the Marshall Islands envoy, Tina Stega said, uh, it uh, violates what we really, even the Paris Climate Agreement acknowledged that 1.5 degree rise by the end of the century, even though it probably hit it this decade, um, is not negotiable and it means, quote, an end to fossil fuels. So it's where uh, the gas loophole comes in as transitional and where abatement of coal is allowed for, that, that is through trying to, to draw in the carbon that's emitted through a sequestration and store it underground, uh, that we can see the danger of this. And the need really to, I think, delegitimize the COP process because it's not going to stop here. Next year, it goes to Azerbaijan. And that was a hotly contested choice for the hosting of the COP29 a year from now. And Azerbaijan and Baku, the capital city, absolutely carbon addicted, one of the very worst in the world, and um, very connected to um, particularly Vladimir Putin, who didn't want to see um, a member of the EU uh, host the, the COP29. You could argue that in uh, 2025, it will then go to Brazil, where uh, Lula da Silva, who has a strong environmental minister, Maria Silva, they do want to host it in the Amazon, in Belém, and make some real progress. But between now and then, I think the activists out there have to understand that looking globally for solutions from the Conference of Polluters, what I would call this global stock take document, oil jabber, in honor of Al, -Jab uh, Al Jabber, that really isn't uh, going to take us anywhere. There's a debate. Bill McKibben, the great 350.org founder, has argued, and we've had some email debates about this, that you can at least use that transition out of fossil fuels for your activism. I hope so. But as I said, the uh, loopholes, the weasel words, are really uh, debilitating. So it may be that, like most of the cops, the more that we put our, uh, let's say, uh, faith in leaders, not only Al Jabra, but South Africa sent um, a key person, uh, Barbara Creasy, uh, the environment minister, the more we put our faith in uh, these global climate policy elites, uh, the uh, less we do activism to directly uh, halt the emissions and block fossil fuel projects and try to make other changes through, as Naomi Klein puts it, blockadia. Um, that's really where the future lies, and we shouldn't be distracted by these global processes that are really so reactionary. You mentioned the small island nations, and the Marshall Islands, for example, said that the global stock take has been a death sentence for them, given that any sort of warming that goes beyond 1.5 degrees will inevitably lead to a destruction of their economies, given that, you know, they're island states. So they're highly vulnerable to any sort of change in water levels and that sort of thing. Um, and they also said that the decisions to adopt the global stock take or to endorse it were made without them even being in the room, without their ability to consent to it or legitimize it. So do you think this was done intentionally to avoid having their input? Well, I think that's a good question because uh, Samoa had a very strong uh, lead negotiator and Rasmussen, and she was furious with Al Jaber, the head of the uh, COP. And she said, quote, you just gaveled the decisions and the small island developing states were not in the room. It is not enough for us to reference the science and then make agreements that ignore what the science is telling us we need to do. They were the small island states who are really faced with the extinction uh, of their island homelands. They were simply having a caucus and preparing. And uh, in that space, uh, as Al Jabber on Wednesday morning, the sort of last day, the day after it was meant to end, just pushed it through. And the tragedy is that the elites there, they did um, you know, give her a standing ovation, but they also gave Al Jabber a standing ovation. It just shows the profound schizophrenia. And what do you make of the influence of the IMF in this particular document? Because there was um, an IMF panel while COP was going on with uh, the head of the IMF, Georgieva, speaking about the need to ensure that there are no barriers to trade in this green transition, that there's enough research and development and subsidies for research and development, a reduction of subsidies for fossil fuels, but that there should be no barriers or impediments 
to trade in, in, I guess, developing some of these technologies. And if I recall correctly, um, the carbon border adjustment mechanism tax was stripped away from the global stock take. And this would, you know, put an additional tax on high carbon emission products. So what do you make of that? Yes, indeed. Uh, the CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, was hotly contested. And the IMF said that the um, uh, interference in trade should be avoided, even though actually the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, has been uh, relatively ambiguous. And the leader of that uh, institution, who's a Nigerian, Ngozi Okonjo Iwalo, said she wasn't going to, you know, sort of chime in on either side. So on one side, led by South Africa, by Barbara Creasy, the environment minister, uh, was is the position, particularly from basic Brazil, South Africa, India, China. But also uh, Creasy was able to get this position through the Africa Climate Summit, which occurred in September. And that position is take out these um, uh, uh, trade barriers, which are unilateral. And on the other side would be the Europeans. Now, you could call the Europeans, as I'm not... Um, unwilling to do, imperialist and protectionist. And yet they have a logic we have to be acutely aware of. They've got a, a carbon tax of sorts. It's an emissions trading scheme. They give a lot of free credits. Those are beginning to wane. And their uh, price of that tax, it's up and down. It was up to over $100 uh, per ton of carbon emitted. You have to pay on top of uh, all the other costs in your production process. It's now 85. It, it's really zigzagging because of you know, like all financial markets, it's a it's a incredibly volatile way to handle something as important as uh, putting a price on on carbon. It's a ridiculous way to do it, to be frank. But that price, eighty five dollars per ton today, is in contrast to say South Africa's carbon tax, which is around thirty U.S. cents per ton. So you can see this huge difference, which means if you want to cheat the EU, you're a company there. You shut down your own. Uh, let's say, steel or aluminium or petrochemical or uh, high carbon production system, there's a, a variety of, of goods that are going to be uh, immediately taxed, even cement. And um, instead of having foundries making steel in Europe, you import them from South Africa, where a big Luxembourg-based company, uh, Arcelor Mittal, run by an Indian, Lakshmi Mittal, has set up a number of the, the foundries here, and we export a fair bit of steel aluminium, petrochemicals, and other high carbon inputs. So if we do that from South Africa with a very low carbon tax, there's a carbon leakage, which means that the Europeans will be importing what they're trying to ban or put a high price on in Europe. And that's what the European steel producers are saying, uh, we're going to need some protection here. And I think that's actually perfectly reasonable, even though it is imperialist and protectionist. But it does reflect, it, doesn't it, that South Africa and the other countries affected. There will be a, a couple of other African countries, basically South Africa, but certainly China and Brazil, as they produce high carbon intensive uh, output from you know embedded energy that comes from coal-fired power plants. Well, they'll be uh, subject to a tariff. And that was also, by the way, the United Kingdom announced, and the United States is going through similar debates about how to um, avoid this sort of leakage or uh, the cheating uh, by just moving the problem around. So I think there is a logic, which I can't deny, from imperialism. But the sub-imperial powers, the ones I mentioned, they're very angry that this may mean that their heavy industries, which are actually mostly Western multinationals here, it'll be ArcelorMittal, Luxembourg, it'll be BHP Billiton, the major aluminum company that's from Australia. It'll be uh, Western car companies uh, from Germany, uh, uh, Japan, and the U.S., It'll be a, a partly U.S.-owned uh, petrochemical. Those will be the main ones that will be uh, adversely affected by the CBAM. Now, to come back to the IMF, um, the IMF has this uh, terribly confused role because Kristalina Georgieva, the current managing director, did replace um, Christ, uh, 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 Christian, uh, sorry, uh, Lagarde, uh, Christine, Christine Lagarde. Lagarde. Yeah, and in that replacement, uh, Georgieva wanted very much to um, put her own mark on the institution. She's an economist. She comes from Eastern Europe. Um, there was no hope of getting a, a third world leader of the IMF, given these uh, historical apartheid type of rules. The Europeans run the IMF uh, and American runs the World Bank. 
So what she did was to start saying, I care about climate, and they started to count the damage of climate. So you're right that on the one hand, they have their standard neoliberalism applied to trade to try to get climate uh, out of trade in, in the way they're not approving the CBAM. However, what they do acknowledge is uh, that there's, let's say, a subsidization that's both explicit, where, say, oil companies are getting subsidies to go and drill. The U.S. is notorious. But also, there's implicit, because if you're not taxing carbon at the right rate, you're basically allowing them to pollute without penalty, without paying. And that implicit uh, subsidy is most of what they say is a $7 trillion per year. However, when we look at that with a little bit more critical perspective, it's currently they're pricing the carbon at $65 a ton. And I think not 85 as the EU uh, emissions trading scheme, or even um, the 185 that the United States would like to put on, or at least the Environmental Protection Agency currently is $51 a ton. But actually, the, some of the research that I trust much more from from scholars who do environmental economics with a much greater sense of the feedback loops, and their price is $3,000 a ton. So you can see if you're getting into this game of pricing, well, I wouldn't go with the IMF, which is very conservative on this. And where we do these debates, uh, Talia, in environmental impact assessments or trying to go to uh, uh, our courts, we haven't yet found in a place like South Africa the ability of our technocratic elite to make a price on carbon really change behavior. And that's the dilemma. We'd like a price like the carbon border adjustment mechanism or ca tax on imports to really change the way our own output, for example, our steel and aluminium is made. Because it is possible to make it with renewable energy. We have huge reserves of sunlight and wind and lots of energy storage uh, potential. But the fact that we don't have a tax means there's no real incentive to make any change. And the continual pollution of a country like South Africa, based on the multinational corporates that do high carbon exports, is a problem that I think our own climate justice movement cannot achieve um, the sufficient power to correct without the sanctions, that is climate sanctions, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. It's a tricky situation because when do you want Western imperial power to side with you as a progressive? Rarely, if ever. There may be cases. There may be cases where in the United States, Ronald Reagan was overturned on his veto of sanctions against apartheid South Africa. And the US Congress actually sided with the black majority in demanding sanctions. So there are cases where I think even imperialists need to be, let's say, positioned so that the kind of damage that they do ordinarily, that is by importing high carbon products, can be mitigated. And I think these sorts of sanctions, we have to look at with an open mind. And would you say that's why Jeremy Hunt, the head of the British uh, exchequer, decided to also impose this carbon tax? Yes. Now, all of these are, as you say, proposals because they um, will require uh, still more debate and discussion and implementation. And in the case of Europe, uh, the European Union says from October this year, they're already doing the bean counting. They're beginning to find out, well, how much should this import tax be and who's going to be liable for it. And in the case uh, of uh, Europe, that will only kick in with pricing in 2026. In the case of Britain, what uh, Hunt and the Treasury have said, let's do this in 2027, starting with steel. But I anticipate this to be the more environmentalists will pick up the pressure. It may be difficult in the US because of potentially Donald Trump as the president again. He obviously won't care a damn about uh, having a high carbon tax. He'll reduce it as he did uh, from the Obama uh, years, from $51 back to $1. Now, that means I think we've got um, a little bit of time here to make the case that the Europeans, the Brits who do the CBAM, uh, actually owe those who are affected um, a just transition grant-based reparations for the damage that will be done. And this is the kind of case we need to make for not just loss and damage, when there's a terrible climate event, as we saw uh, in the Sharm el Sheikh COP27, there's a lot of lobbying to get a fund to help to compensate countries like Pakistan last year, a third of it underwater. Um, many uh, terrible uh, climate catastrophes this year. In South Africa, the worst being 500 people killed in a rain bomb in 2022 in Durban. Now, there are plenty of loss and damage cases, but the big question 
ultimately will be whether a strong just transition can be demanded from the West so that grant funds will actually also help to, uh, let's say, mitigate the damage. Now, we do have a, a very weak version of this here in South Africa. The pilot project came from the US, UK, France, Germany, and the EU, and the World Bank's playing a role. And it's a very weak version. It's called a JETP, a Just Energy Transition uh, Partnership. And it's what we would call a carrot, along with what we were describing, the CBAM, is a stick. So the carrot is to incentivize these just transitions to decarbonize, to get rid of our coal-fired power plants earlier than we would you know, when they break down and fall apart. And we should be doing that. And there's a huge debate about how fast to do it. But what they fail to do is to um, offset the damage to communities and workers that have become coal dependent. And similarly, we have a jet P, which is a stick, but it's not really working very well. For example, Europe says methane is green, nuclear is green. Um, so we haven't yet found ways that the stick can be sharper and harder and that the carrot can be nutritious. Currently, it, it's quite rotten. And that carrot and stick, let's say, combination is what I think our global climate justice movement has to begin to work together because the elites are doing the deals behind closed doors and making a big mess of it. As I said, Barbara Creasy, particularly our environment minister, who was the co-author of the Global Stock Take, the final document, and who, one of whose officials was a co-chair of the uh, the um, loss and damage fund with a, with a Norwegian official, a Danish official was the co-chair. We're really looking at, unfortunately, uh, global elites who are siding with Al Jaber instead of delegitimizing, kicking him out. Barbara Creasy is also very much um, subject to the power of the coal uh, and the new methane gas lobby here in South Africa. And those are the sorts of dilemmas that really speak to a need for profound radical political challenges from the base. So last Saturday, December 9, we saw 28 protests along our beachfronts uh, in the Indian Ocean and Atlantic coast because uh, they're now getting approvals from Barbara Creasy for Total, for um, Shell, for uh, a local ally uh, called Impact uh, Oil, run by a man called Johnny Copeland. And these are the kind of figures who are getting, you know, the, the thumbs up as we speak to go and uh, drill for more gas and oil. And so we really need much more radical political movements from below and maybe changes of governments to get rid of these kinds of policy elites. Right. Barbara Creasy doesn't seem to be the one to oppose um, any sort of approval of these additional oil and gas offshore drilling contracts with con uh, companies such as Total Energies, as you mentioned. But I, I do want to ask another question about the loss and damage fund, because the loss and damage fund was discussed very much in um, Sharm el Sheikh during COP27. And I think COP28 establishes the fund and establishes the World Bank as the overseer of the fund. And the World Bank is, of course, led by business-friendly Ajay uh, Banga. What do you make of the fund? I mean, do, is it really worth its salt? So far, it seems like one of the, the biggest emitters in the world, the United States, is only committed to contributing 17.5, was it billion or I mean, million? The, I can't remember yes, how much, but it wasn't a million. You okay, know, you, so really not a thousand, huge 17,000, I wouldn't be surprised. Yes, that's, that's very, very uh, acute observations about Number one, who's responsible for the crisis? And are we going to let them uh, be in charge of cleaning it up? And why aren't we uh, charging them more, like especially the United States? But I would even add the BRICS, because it's not just the West that are climate debt denialists. That is, they're refusing to acknowledge the polluter pace. That's even in their own national environmental legislation. If, you, if they make a mess inside the US, you know, then there's a super fund that the polluters contribute to to clean it up. That's what we need, a global super fund for paying those reparations for the climate catastrophe. And uh, John Kerry, the U.S. climate czar, testified in the um, U.S. Congress in July that he just absolutely denied liability. And he made very clear, we explicitly removed liability from any discussion. In fact, it was in the Paris Climate Agreement that if you sign on, you forgave the West and the BRICS for their high emissions. So that's one uh, crucial dilemma. And of course, that means that the US can give merely tokenistic support, 17.5 million. So the, the amounts that will be needed will be in the 100 billion a year range. That's the, the, the kind of costs of uh, the damage, especially because the insurance 
that the North provides to, say, mansions on the uh, South Florida coast is just not available. 60% of the damage done under uh, the uh, prior, let's say, uh, catastrophes that have been measured by Christian aid in the North, 60% is insured, but only 4% in the South. And so we desperately need that loss and damage fund, especially for countries that not only then need to do a rebuilding after terrible climate catastrophes, especially cyclones and floods and um, uh, you know high wind, but they have to build back much better. They have to have stronger stormwater drainage and better irrigation systems and uh, tougher roads and bridges that can withstand uh, the terrible uh, climate catastrophes. Now, the U.S. is... Uh, amongst those that are most affected because they continue to have ever worsening hurricanes, tornadoes, and uh, you know, droughts and uh, water shortages. Um, and they're putting their money back, as the Inflation Reduction Act does, in various ways for renewable energy investments and for some of this loss and damage. But it is the ultimate hypocrisy of a of a um, absolutely irresponsible global citizen that the U.S. Uh, is only playing a little bit. And then they're pressuring and of course, the South Africans and some of the BRICS countries agree that the World Bank becomes the manager. And when we've seen the World Bank manage these funds, yeah, their value systems, they are the single biggest historic financier of fossil fuels. And even still to this day, we see in South Africa, an LNG, liquefied natural gas terminal, is being uh, financed in its early stages by the World Bank's International Finance Corporation. And again and again, we find um, you know a terrible legacy that continues of of World Bank fossil financing. Um, and I think also the general neoliberal t uh, tendencies of these funds in which um, a blending is desired, in which the private sector is brought in, and in a sense that uh, subsidies go to uh, reduce the risk. So we're seeing a sort of Wall Street uh, consensus emerge away from uh, what normal social democratic states do, which is when they see a crisis, they uh, are often pressured to move in and solve the problem using grants. And instead now we're getting blended finance and public private partnerships and um, all manner of uh, climate financing gimmicks. And it's just appalling because the uh, hard currency loans that, for example, we have in our JetP, 97% of our uh, so-called concessional finance from the West is in dollars or euros um, and that means uh, and pounds. And that means we're repaying in the hard currency. But as our currency falls, of course, to effective interest rate goes up to the point where it's unaffordable. So it just layers more debt. And these are conditions, even last week, Ethiopia, crucial country, one of the new BRICS Plus members, um, uh, very much subject to climate catastrophes, has uh, gone bankrupt. And before that, it was Ghana and, and Zambia. So we're seeing even countries that had been sort of considered to be stars of the 2010s and economic activity face the 2020s, the lower commodity prices, the higher interest rates from 2022, the inability to pay the debts. And now the only solution from the global elites is more climate debt uh, piled on top. Well, you mentioned the BRICS's problematic position here, especially given that they're huge carbon emitters. And I'm thinking specifically now of India, for example, because India was not endorsing the global stock takes commitment to phase out unabated coal use. And that's probably because 73% of power generation in India is based on coal. And there are quite a few stakeholders in India that would argue that countries such as India and other countries in the global south, because of the legacies of colonialism and other forms of exploitation, have not been able to develop industrially or economically at the same rate as other countries uh, in the global north. And they should be allowed to emit more in order to reach those levels of advanced industrialization and have you know greater G GDP and economic growth. What do you make of that argument? Is that just an excuse to continue emissions and to potentially ensure that the elite are profiting from those developments? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there was a great uh, uh, sort of strategist uh, connected to Greenpeace India and, and some of the organic social movements there. Praful Bidwai, and they put a critique out a dozen years ago saying this is so-called hiding behind the poor. That is to say, in making a case, as Narendra Modi does, that he's really um, for the people and you need to have um, you know, much in greater increases in energy availability. 
actually the way in which uh, the uh, coal-fired power plants are being uh, rolled out, still in India, still in China, benefits elites and exporters and high carbon producers, but doesn't ever solve the problems, the energy problems of the poor. The same is true in South Africa. We have lots of this talk left, walk right, or talk green, walk dirty, hiding behind the poor. And I think that's where the really interesting problem of the BRICS, who claim to be multipolar, and we've, we've kind of talked about them at length, um, making an advertisement that if Western corporate power and uh, United States uh, power over multilaterals is suffocating and we need a new system of balancing with the new emerging economies like China and India as the most uh, obvious ones. Um, nevertheless, in reality, in places like the UNFCCC, as well as the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, uh, you'll find uh, the most reactionary forces in um, both the West and the BRICS cohering. And again, the two crucial points for them both is not to cut the emissions and the fossil fuel use, firstly, and not to cut uh, not to acknowledge their their uh, reparations uh, liability, say that they refuse polluter pays. Those are the two areas where again and again, especially since the 2009 Copenhagen summit, where Jacob Zuma, our South African president, joined Wen Jibao from China, Manmohan Singh from India, uh, and Lula from uh, Brazil, and uh, Barack Obama from the US barged into their meeting. And they basically set in motion um, this process by which uh, the uh, emerging economies can complain, but they're basically satisfied with the deal. Even Vladimir Putin said he was absolutely satisfied with um, what came out of the COP28. And I, I just think it's this awful dilemma where we keep talking about the North and the South or the developed and the developing, but we're failing to acknowledge that between imperialist climate uh, policymakers and the vast majority of the world as victims stand a sub-imperialist um, comprador elite who are perfectly assimilated into the system. You know, we've seen that as well, notwithstanding huge contradictions in the way geopolitics plays out, whether that's in relation to um, uh, Ukraine and, and uh, the Russian invasion, but particularly it's on display because of uh, the, the four new BRICS members who are from the Middle East. Uh, three of them are strong U.S. allies, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. With UAE um, having, in 2021, signed the Abram Accords and, of course, with Egypt long having normalized relations with Israel. And in the Israeli genocide uh, against the Gazans, um, of course, it's only Iran that perhaps with their uh, Houthi uh, rebel, maybe with Hezbollah, uh, you know, are sort of on the side of the Palestinians in a concrete way. But in the BRICS discussions, you'll see just how schizophrenic and how ineffectual this so-called multipolar alternative is because... They've made no dent whatsoever in the power relations. And indeed, when a yeah, maybe a Houthi uh, um, missile is fired against Israel, it'll actually be Saudi Arabia uh, doing the first line of defense on behalf of Israel. So it's an extraordinary period of, um, let's say, fluidity and the inability of a BRICS to stand up and really become an anti-imperial force when the world needs it so badly, instead behaving largely as sub-imperialists. Well, why do you think there is no united front on the part of the BRICS or the BRICS plus with the, the additional Middle Eastern countries which have just joined it? Is it because their primary interest does revolve around economic interests and they're maybe not able to have some sort of solidarity with even the Palestinians, for example, if you look at the if you look at Israel's ongoing ethnic cleansing and bombardment of the Gaza Strip? Yes, I mean, we have a very good view of this in South Africa, and it's partly economic because we have about $500 million worth of trade. It's a relatively balanced trade. We export a fair bit of coal and diamonds and grapes to Israel, and we get bits and pieces back. But the roughly $500 million a year is important, and that's why, in spite of some good rhetoric from our Pretoria government, they do declare uh, Israel to be an apartheid state. They do go to the International Criminal Court with that complaint. They're even using genocide, and indeed, uh, the big challenge will be to invoke the Genocide Convention, if they're serious about it, also to expel the Israeli ambassador. Currently, um, the embassy in uh, Tel Aviv, South Africa's embassy, is closed, but we haven't uh, shut it down. We haven't withdrawn it. Um, and secondly, we're looking for more BDS support because uh, aside from one meeting in which 
uh, Muslim uh, Palestine solidarity activists pressured the government to withdraw Israeli South Africans who are part Israeli they could have dual citizenship or they go from uh, some of the Zionist schools and they serve in the IDF uh, so that's now going to be perhaps regulated it's, it's not meant to happen it's been happening for years um, there's also some important relationships between the ANC the ruling party's main funder His name is Ivor Jakovic he's the single largest funder publicly disclosed this year and he has an office in Tel Aviv for his defense industries, which is called Paramount Group, and they have a joint venture with Elbit, the main uh, Israeli arms company, to supply a very brutal Ecuadorian army uh, with uh, sophisticated uh, military uh, vehicles. Now, these are the sorts of things that you could say in a micro uh, calls them, not nearly as big as what the West does, but certainly South Africa has had important relationships. It goes back to joint development of a nuclear weapons technology in the late 1970s. Um, and so there, there are relationships of that sort. I mean, India, most of all, because uh, Modi has always been very close to Netanyahu and they've had very strong military relationships with the Israeli companies. Um, and in addition, I think the dilemma for the BRICS is that they haven't worked well geopolitically because of very important divisions. And that was very obvious with Lula not entirely supporting the um, Russian invasion, you know, voting against Russia in the General Assembly, uh, South Africa having lots of ambiguities. But if we look forward, Russia is going to be hosting the BRICS, and what they'd like to do is expand the membership, and that'll be in uh, October this year. Um, and the dilemma is for them, I mean, if they are going to take amongst the 21 countries that applied this year, only six were chosen, one of which, Argentina, dropped out because of the election of Javier uh, Millet, the right-winger. He didn't want to be, have any part of BRICS. And so there are these five countries that are coming into the BRICS. Now, last week, I spent a couple of hours with the BRICS Bank vice president, and that's the second huge contradiction. And as you say, it is an economic one because this man uh, named Leslie Master, a very bright man, I once worked with him on writing policy papers for Mandela's government. But he is very convinced that the Western credit rating agencies are who he must answer to as the main... Uh, the chief financial officer, the vice president. So Standard & Poor's, Company. Moody's, those companies. Exactly. And, and Talia, if you, if you know these uh, countries that are under the thumb, which include Western countries, I mean, even the US has been under the thumb of the credit rating agencies and had its, uh, its uh, debt uh, rating downgraded. Obviously, they go through scares every uh, so often where the, the bills may not be paid in the US government. But the main point about that is really we have a block within the BRICS it's mostly the finance ministers and central bank governors and the bankers who you know circulate amongst them. And there's a revolving door between uh, our own banks and these officials. Um, and they really are so pro-Western that if you want to raise something like de-dollarization inside the BRICS, you're not going to go anywhere with it, as we found in August. And it may be that in o October next year, Russia is so desperate because it you know has been shut out of the big international payment system, the SWIFT that they want to now, okay, let's go forward and see if we can do something. Maybe it'll be yuan-based, but even the renminbi, the main way that Chinese trade abroad, is very difficult to use because they retain strong exchange controls. And the relationship between India and Russia, where there's a huge trade deficit because India has been taking in so much Russian energy, the ruble and the rupee are terribly imbalanced. So all of those processes that we've chatted about before in which de-dollarization is run aground, now I think does exactly um, uh, confirm uh, your point. Economic interests within the BRICS and ambiguous interests in relation to uh, the Israeli links mean we may not see much uh, potential for the BRICS to do anything to put pressure on Israel to stop uh, the, um, the genocide. And we're here in South Africa, we're on the front line because we have such a good experience with boycott, divestment, sanctions against apartheid, which was a crucial part of getting rid of uh, official racism here, to have international sanctions. And that's what we'd love to see happen, maybe even the SWIFT system in Belgium, which uh, has a relatively more progressive European leader um, opposed to Israeli genocide. And, and that would be the sort of campaigning lessons I think we would take. BDS is terribly important now to pick up against Israeli genocide. Um, and then as well to cut uh, these relationships and uh, to call uh, Israel uh, genocidal in uh, that convention. And these are the sorts of things our, 
our own government, even under um, Cyril Ramaphosa, is willing to use words like genocide and apartheid. I just point out one one last um, aspect of this. Mandela Mandela, the grandson of Nelson Mandela, has been leading the cause inside the African National Congress as a member of parliament for this party to say, Ramaphosa, stop mollycoddling the Israeli apartheid regime's genocide. So that's very tough language from Mandela's grandson. It shows you just how far, even after good rhetoric from Pretoria, but how far we have to go to turn that into reality. I do want to ask you, though, I mean, there are a few members of Hamas who attended a, a meeting with Mandela Mandela in South Africa. I mean, how problematic is that? Well, there's certainly the South African government uh, said we have nothing to do with that. And they met the South African Jewish Board of Deputies and the South African Zionist Federation last week. In a sense, I wouldn't say apologetically, but they said, look, we're, we don't have any control of whether Hamas comes in and out of the country, but don't worry, we didn't host them. We're not meeting with them. At one point, there was a phone call between the foreign minister here and Lady Pandor and Hamas. But we don't really see any sense in which there's uh, you know, any recognition of Hamas. There is a recognition of uh, uh, Fatah and uh, Palestinian Authority, and that's been, you know, slowed us down enormously because the Palestinian Authority has opposed BDS except for goods produced within the occupied uh, West Bank, but the, the, the territories. But the main point about um, Hamas here is it has a re relatively more symbolic role. And what it has done, uh, because it was a political wing of Hamas based in Qatar who came uh, three uh, of their officials uh, to a meeting that Mandela Mandela hosted, sort of raised the profile of the need for solidarity, but it has left, especially those who come from more secular uh, traditions like BDS, who are uh, uh, non-sectarian and, and non-religious in their support for Palestine, with the need to continue to hit the streets and protest. And you know, every day sitting around as a, as a BDS uh, researcher, uh, looking at the uh, WhatsApp streams of uh, activities coming in, it's quite inspiring. A thousand people just Im immediately kind of convened at the Zara store last week to protest once it became known uh, their Israeli connections. And we find many little micro targets all over the uh, place. And I, I think the, the big question is, can we keep these energies going during this uh, break that we're on in South Africa at the moment, and then really come out uh, with a more coherent strategy that it's the state and capital and uh, particularly uh, the military relations like the soldiers that go over or the paramount group's connections to Israel. Well, just looking back over this past year, 2023, there have been so many tragic and destructive developments. Um, obviously, you know, the ongoing war in Ukraine, but of course, uh, what's going on in, in Gaza and Israel's not only genocide, but also ecocide. I mean, they've been doing all sorts of environmental destruction um, to the Gaza Strip and also, you know, illegal settlers, removing all of trees, destroying all of trees in the West Bank. So there, of course horrible developments there, but is there anything that perhaps is going in the right direction that kind of gives you a bit of hope or something to latch onto for enacting some sort of change? Yeah, I mean, obviously with um, global elites having failed, they even have a term for their failure. It's quite interesting, Talia. The poly crisis, you find that in the World Economic Forum and their inability to address everything from pandemic management to the climate catastrophe and biodiversity uh, loss and uh, six great species extinction and economic inequality and turbulence, financial crashes and uh, uh, geopolitics and uh, all of the extreme, let's see, rising tensions and hardcore right-wing figures popping up everywhere. So the failure at the top reminds of just two things that I think we always need to keep in mind. 1987, there was a similar threat ecologically, which was the ozone hole growing and the 1987 Montreal Protocol did arrive at a point where the cause of that, the chlorofluorocarbons, were banned, and the ozone hole is subsequently stabilized. The second was the Global Fund to Fight TB, AIDS, and Malaria, which followed in 2002. Um, uh, uh, the World Trade Organization agreeing that medicines, public good, uh, could be taken off intellectual property. Now, we lost that fight for COVID vaccines uh, in 2022 in the WTO, but it's a model in the sense of what a loss and damage uh, should be and could be if we got a stronger set of, uh, let's say, states in the United Nations that had 
real interest in solving loss and damage, um, the climate debt, the reparations. Um, and so we need obviously more activists like they had in uh, the early 2000s, the Treatment Action Campaign, uh, the um, ACT UP group uh, uh, out of uh, the, uh, the US, um, Medicine Sans Frontieres, Oxfam. So they played a great role then. And that's what we're, I think, uh, to turn to what's more hopeful today, uh, the return of pressure and global climate activists who are doing more and more direct action. And that I've seen, you know, places that are uh, very coal intensive, like the Ruhr Valley of Germany, and you see the Ende Gelände, Let's a Generation, or you see Extinction Rebellion and um, No to Oil. You see all of these movements popping up, the ones in the United States that have indigenous um, uh, strengths in water, defender politics, but they're also climate activists. All of these, um, to me, are the source of hope. And when we saw mass protests uh, over a period now of two years that also went into the courts and began to slow down the offshore gas and oil drilling here. To me, that was one of the great ways um, that 2023 reminds of the potential of grassroots power. The second being Palestine solidarity, to see the upsurge, uh, anti-racism and, and uh, anti-Zionism that has been so, let's say, effective in putting Israel on the back foot in terms of uh, how it tries to market and spin doctor its genocide so that only a few elites like a Joe Biden or uh, uh, Olaf Scholz or Rishi Sunak can kind of uh, basically still stand with Netanyahu, someone like Macron walking away as fast as possible. And those to me reflect that the delegitimization of the global elites has been another part of what we're up about. And the more we can put pressure to halt that genocide and to begin to roll it back and to find some way to make really concrete uh, the free Palestine slogan, uh, the more that we hear from Palestinians about how we should be proceeding as the uh, as the terrible carnage hopefully comes to an end, we can think about a longer term plan. That's what we need with both movements and, of course, to expand everywhere. The World Social Forum gets held in Nepal. There are going to be um, a variety of other you know, sites around the world where people are going to gather and do strategy. But what I'm hoping is that the sort of upsurge of support for Palestinians and the upsurge of climate uh, protests that here in South Africa and around the world uh, give me so much faith that they will begin to link uh, themselves to each other uh, and to uh, link to all of the other issues where we desperately need anti-imperialist and frankly anti-sub-imperialist politics. Well, not to disregard or belittle your reasons for hope, but if we look at the United States and Israel, they're increasingly isolated internationally, and yet this international isolation has had very little effect in terms of policies on the ground. I mean, we just saw the General Assembly, for example, pass a resolution in which 153 member states called for the immediate cessation of hostilities and immediate ceasefire. Even Canada and Australia changed their vote and decided to vote for this res resolution, and yet due to the power imbalances of the global system and the UN system, in particular, this has had very little effect. Well, and even worse, you could say that um, looming over Joe Biden's uh, uh, pro-Israeli stance and fossil fuel uh, amplification, because he's you know setting up even more LNG export facilities in the Gulf of Mexico and more oil drilling in Alaska and all over the show. Um, behind him stands another threat, Donald Trump, and even a, a third party potential candidate, uh, RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, has come out in a manner that's absolutely imperialist in relation to uh, Israel's genocide. He's, he's all for supporting Israel. So yeah, the, the political landscape looks absolutely grim, and yet the potential that uh, the U.S. has for sudden increases in political pressure from below, like Black Lives Matter um, in 2020, even in the midst of COVID, do um, those sorts of potentials do surprise us, as they have everywhere. I mean, we've had uh, the upsurge of protests in North Africa and the Middle East and the so-called Arab Spring that seemed to have come from nowhere. Now, it was repressed, but it's I think that rise and occasional uh, victories of social movements, our treatment action campaign, our students winning fees must fall here to get rid of fees on uh, tertiary education for working class students, uh, social movements that win uh, demands for water and sanitation and electricity, um, all manner of micro struggles around the world 
We've had too many of them take the form, Talia, of popcorn, where they, they kind of pop up, but then fall back without finding a coherent movement politics. And I can at least just say that uh, our independent left uh, in South Africa is beginning to regroup. There's a, a new movement that just formed last weekend called Zabalaza for Socialism, Zabalaza meaning struggle. And there are those little indications that there is still a desperate need that's recognized by our uh, leading activists, um, a need for ideology and for transcending capitalist and um, in let's call them uh, uh, sort of in the silo, um, uh, atomized modes of resisting a huge imperialist threat to humanity and making those uh, issues um, as explicit as possible all the time and linking them together rather than uh, being in a sort of NGO mode where they're all fractured and fragmented. That's, I think, our challenge for the period immediately ahead. Well, let's hope we meet that challenge and are able to enact more change in 2024. Patrick Bond, thank you so much for joining me again. It's great to be with you, Tanya. Warm greetings. Hope you have a good holiday. Same to you, Patrick. And thank you to all of our viewers and listeners for supporting the show and making contributions so that we can continue to make the content that we do. If you'd like to support us, you can do so by going to our website, theanalysis.news, and also getting onto our newsletter. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.